we're going to be doing. So um, hopefully you pick up a book and you're reading through the first chapters. Uh, we are, uh, as, a, as a theme this year, we're especially talking about being sent. And um, turn this down just a little bit there. Um, and, and so, um, especially as we now get out of the COVID kind of way of thinking, um, uh, we want to move from being internally focused to being externally focused. When, and, and that's really the way that Christians are called to live their lives, uh, to be not focused on ourselves. And, um, and uh, so the first week is just an introduction to that kind of thinking and theme. And we've chosen um, three different lessons uh, to help us focus on that. The first one is from Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, familiar words. Although usually we start stop before we get to the last words in this text, so we're going to read uh, uh, through verse 14. And let's read it responsibly as i got it printed for you. It's the way we'll read it on Sunday. There's a time for everything. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. What do workers gain from their toil? I've seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there's nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live. That each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. And I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken away from it. God does it so that people will fear him. Okay. Um, so just thinking about seasons, the uh, first two questions are kind of those kind of questions. Do you change the clothes in your drawers and closets for the different seasons? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Why? Why? Because you need warmer clothes in the winter. Cooler clothes, I know. Yeah, yeah, and and most of us have an abundance of clothes, so that we do have to do some changing. I mean, you think there's there's a lot of people in this world who don't have uh, changes of clothes for every season. But yeah, obviously, um, uh, you wear different clothes depending on the weather, depending on the season. What's your favorite season, and which do you wish would be longer, and which one do you wish would be shorter? Fall is my favorite. I think in, in Wisconsin, I think there's three places in the world that have the most beautiful falls. And it's Wisconsin, and I think out east, I think it's, it's Virginia. I know, out east, which... Um, New England's beautiful. New England. We did that a couple of years ago. And then, and then the other one is Germany. I think that's oh right. yeah, and and those are the three that have the best colors, and I know that because <clears throat> when we moved to Illinois, when I lived to Illinois for a while, their spring is longer, and their their flowering trees last longer, but their fall the leaves turn and the next day they're all gone, hmm. and I forgot that. So we lived there for in the Illinois for nine years. When we moved back up here, I remembered how long fall was and how much it was really wonderful. In Wisconsin, so it is different, different places. So it is. It, it, it certainly is, and I know Jerry and I on the way back, we could see some of the trees, Changing. like in the Smoky Mountain area, they were already starting to, to change. <laughs> well, I saw a squirrel yesterday in my front yard carrying something in his mouth and trying to bury it in my flower pot. 
And I'm going, I hope that's not a sign that we're going to have a real cold, cold winter. Cold winter or early winter, you know? Uh, I don't know. They do it all the time. They do that all the time, though. They, they do it all year long. They do it. They take holes. Yeah, and my flowers. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know anybody who wishes that winter would be longer. <laughs> If you were an avid skier, maybe. If you were an avid skier, you might, well. I wish it would just snow on Christmas and then forget it. <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't make your daughter and her family very happy because they do so much skiing. They do, they do. And Abby and, and Caleb were both on the ski, ski team, team in yeah. LA. Yeah, they yeah. were. There wouldn't be any place for them to practice if that was. No, here, not here. They and they got, and they months. worked, they worked out there too. Everybody worked out in the, Summers. Yeah, they work out at Sunburst, so they got free skiing, so they'd ski and then they'd work and then they'd ski some more. So just thinking about the, the list of opposites now, is the teacher describing, because that's what he calls himself, we believe it's Solomon, but is the teacher describing what is or prescribing what should be? I'm going to say an acceptable answer is yes. Right? That's, that's yeah. the Jewish answer. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's both. It's, it's both. So a lot of times in the Bible you have descriptions, and other times you have prescriptions. A prescription is when God says you must do this. A description is just this is what happened. So, you know, there's some, uh, well, what would be an example of a description? Well, it talks about, for instance, um, in when uh, people were uh, selected for an office, the laying on of hands. It says they laid hands on them, prayed over them, and, and so on. Does it ever say in the Bible you must lay hands on somebody in that situation? The answer is no. And we're always very careful to say, now do we do that um, uh, in uh, I mean, you've seen that at a pastor's installation where everybody will come around and lay their hands on his head and all that kind of stuff. And, um, do you see that? Yes. But is it something we have to do? And the answer is no. So that's the difference between description and prescription. Um, there are a lot of things in the Bible that are described, but nothing prescribed. Um, so I said we've got these weddings coming up. Well, we have all kinds of descriptors in the Bible about weddings and wedding feasts and all that kind of stuff. But you can read the Bible from beginning to end. You can't find a simple, uh, single example of a vow. It doesn't exist. It talks about marital vows, but it doesn't ever give you an example of a, of a vow. If, if you think about the way we do weddings, it is radically different than the way they did them in Biblical times, because first of all, your wedding would have been, your marriage would have been arranged, uh, probably by the time you were 12 or 13 years old, and then would have been married probably somewhere between 16 and 20. But the average lifespan in Jesus' day and age was about 52 years. So when we think about Jesus dying on the cross at 33, we say, "Oh, he was such a young man," but in their culture because they didn't have the kind of health care and that kind of stuff that we have, um, he would have been fairly close to being middle-aged. Now, it doesn't mean people didn't live to be 70 and 80, but we forget sometimes that that was the exception and not the rule. My constant example of that is uh, the Social Security system, which when they designed it and set the Social Security age at 65, why did they choose 65? because most people didn't live that long. And the reason why people worry about is Social Security gonna be there is because ever since that day was set, people, as our healthcare has gotten better, and as people are able to eat fresh fruits all year round and all that kind of stuff, as they're able to take care of themselves better, um, our age spans have gotten a lot longer, and so, you know, um, I remember uh, the pastor that I first uh, was kind of my mentor in Berlin, he, he got into Social Security and he said, oh, it's great, it's only 4% <laughs> of your salary, you know? Um, and uh, of 
course now it's what 15 and a half percent and they talk sometimes about even making a larger in terms of the Social Security tax and in most situations your your employer pays half of it you pay half of it but you know like our workers have to pay it all 15 percent and we give them some assistance toward that but we're not required to um, yeah so what is the what why was this written what is the what was going on was there something going on historically why was this well, this is, uh, if you're familiar with uh, Ecclesiastes, so if you... Uh, it says there. Solomon writing it, right? It's Maybe. Solomon writing it, and he's writing it at the end of his life. So these are all so perceptions. That he's, he's, yeah. Um, if you want to, if, if you got your Bible open to Ecclesiastes, okay. Um, uh, somebody want to read verses uh, 12 to 14, for instance, of the first chapter. I, the teacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. I devoted myself to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under heaven. What a heavy burden God has laid on man. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless. I chase after the wind. Oh, that's a real enlightening, yeah. uplifting. But you see what he says is, I was king, and I devoted myself to, this, to, to uh, study and explore everything under the sun. And, um, and, and he talks about that everything uh, in terms of weather patterns, back in verses uh, 4 to 7. Um, one of the things we know about him is that he was uh, uh, he was very interested in, in plant life. He studied, you know, you would say botany today. Uh, uh, so Solomon had studied all these things, and when he says everything is meaningless, what does he mean by that? Well, usually, is the word vanity, right? Which he had a little bit. Different slant to it. Yeah, it sort of gives you a feel of um, useless excess, maybe. Well, this is a great season to think about useless excess because one of the reasons I hate this time of year watching television oh. is because all you get is political ads, mm -hmm. right? And and you think about all of the things that uh, politicians are after power and, you know, that kind of stuff that becomes very, very, very important. But in the grand scale of things, um, you might think you're very important, but, you know, the question is 100 years down the road, who's going to care, you know? And, and I think that's part of what he's getting to is just that life is relatively short that uh, we can accomplish great things personally that maybe other people in our immediate area would know, but do they have any lasting, any lasting value? You know, in my Bible says, the basic thrust of Ecclesiastes is that all of life is meaningless, useless, hollow, futile, and vain if it is not rightly related to God. That's the key. Only when based on God and his word is life worthwhile. Which is why he says, at the end of what we read, you know, God set eternity in the heart. In other words, everything in this world is going to eventually come to an end. But there is something that lasts. And that's the life that God alone can give. It's that eternity that he sets in his heart. And that's why he says, this is a gift of God. When you recognize these things as a gift of God, you see it in a different perspective. You know? Uh, you, so, I just had another grandson. Uh, and all of us who have children, grandchildren, can uh, relate to that. Uh, family, nieces and nephews, all of that kind of stuff. What do you do? You invest in children. Um, and, and sometimes, I just saw an article again about how much kids cost. I think it's up to like three hundred thirty thousand dollars per child right now. <laughs> you know, um, 
And so you might say, well, is the investment worth it? And, and what I say is there's no better investment because you're investing in something that's going to last forever. What, where else can you invest in something that's going to last forever? And especially as you and I have an opportunity to connect, you know, kids and families to Jesus, uh, when it's lived within the context of, uh, of eternal life, um, that's what gives it meaning. And, and, and we kind of know that, I think, intrinsically. Um, because when you get to the end of your life, what are you going to... What are you going to be concerned about? How many different couches you owned over the course of your life? You know, how many different cars you had or what kind they were? Yeah. That's what my dad always said. Once you turn 60, you don't give a damn. <laughs> it's the idea that you've been there and done that. And things that used to bother you when you were 30 or 40, they don't bother you anymore. It's just what it is. So we'll get up in the morning and see if it changes. You know, or what will this day hold? And so your whole attitude changes, and you're you're much more. Most people, I can't say that for everybody, but I think most people are are mellower as they get older. And then I like that. I like. Well, they're mellower, but their filters also fall away. Well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I've been told that by my kids. So. <laughs> their filters also fall away. Um, yeah, and and you, and you think about. Um, uh, what you do for a living and you know how do you see that is it something that is meaningful or or not and a lot of that has to do with your attitude toward it not the intrinsic value of that particular thing as you know that's that old story about the person who is digging a hole and one person says well, what are you doing and one worker says I'm digging a hole and the other person says I'm laying a foundation for a skyscraper you know, do you see the value of what you're doing to contribute to something else? Do you see it in terms of a greater purpose and a greater service to other people? Or is it just a way to make a buck? You know, and um, rightly or wrongly, sometimes I've had people who have come to me who have been very, very upset, concerned about their job situation. And, you know, my question to them is usually, well, why are you doing it? You know, and my own reflection on that kind of in, in line with what Solomon says, and I've told that to my kids, you know, life's too short to spend 40 uh, years doing something you hate. It's just too short. And, and it'll make you miserable. And in the con as a consequence, it'll probably make everybody around you miserable, too. <laughs> because you'll bring that misery with you wherever you go, you know? And, 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 um, and so you have to make choices that, that say, no, I, I want to do something that uh, will allow me to use my talents, gifts, and abilities in such a way that I'm able to contribute to this world, take care of my own needs. But, but as he says, to be find satisfaction in all their toil. That's what made me retire. I always said I would do it as long as it was fun. Mm -hmm. It's not fun anymore. I'm done. You're done. Yeah, and I'm glad I worked as long as I did because I think if I would have done it earlier, I would have wanted to bump back and finish off. So I think that that made a difference. But when I got to the point where I was done, I was done. So people say you're going to teach anymore? Nah, I'm done. So it's that 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 gift. Um, and it's both prescribing what is, the fact is there are these different seasons and times, but it's also the way you look at it. Do you recognize when there's a time for something? So um, I think a, a, a time to mourn and a time to dance that sometimes people thinking about grief get so caught up in it that, that all they do is grieve. And what I've encouraged people when they have those kind of feelings to do is to think of it like reading a book. You don't necessarily have to read it from cover to cover in one sitting. You can put it on a shelf. 
and you can turn your mind toward other things, and then, but you always know that book's going to be there, right? You can always pull it off the shelf, and part of, I think, a healthy grieving process is being able to give yourself permission when you're grieving to grieve really hard. But then to say, it's okay for me, it's not healthy for me to grieve all the time. Um, I've got to step out of that particular feeling um, for a little while and, 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 and have some balance. So it's a time to grieve and a time to dance. You know, you, and you can't dance your way through life either, <laughs> much as you or I might like to, depending on whether you love dancing or not. I have happy feet, so anytime around music, my feet want to, want to go. Uh, what's the burden that God has laid on the human race? He's, he says that I've seen the burden that God has laid on the human race, and we've kind of been talking about it. Um, what is it? I think that work is work. I mean, it used to be with Adam and Eve, work was joy, and now it becomes a burden just to exist in some cases. Uh, and that's what we're doing. Is we're, if we're looking at it at, that way, then it becomes just an existence that can be the burden. Meaningless work leads to a meaningless life. And unless you're connected to God, as Karen rightly noted there, and that's really what he's making the, uh, the uh, uh, the reference to here is that unless you're connected to God, and then your work is meaningless, unless it's done for the sake of, um, to glorify God and to be a benefit to others and to yourself, to love yourself and your neighbor through your, your work. What does it mean that God has set eternity in the human heart? And how do you see this truth? How do you see evidence of this truth? And you wonder why God took somebody who is just doing really well and, and doing a lot in this world and then you say, well, that's it? That's that, that can't be. I mean, you spend your whole life preparing to be the best that you could possibly be and you, some people are cut down in the flower of life or when you think they're, they're just starting and then you say, well, there's got to be something more and there is something more. And when you look at it that way, it becomes a continuation. So it's just... It's just that sense hard. that there's got to be more. something more. And uh, it always makes me think of the Sugar Land song. Got to be something more. <laughs> you know? Um, that there's got to be something more. And, you know, one of the things that people will say is, well, more and more people are becoming less godly. Well, I would say that they're becoming less uh, specific religion godly, but they've also actually become in some ways more spiritual. And and still, when somebody says, uh, well, you know, how can you believe in God? Well, I'm sorry, about 85% of the world believes in some God. Whether you're Hindu or you're Buddhist or you're Christian or you're Muslim, about 85% of the world believes in some kind of God, some kind of life after death, some kind of place to go. Um, and while it's defined differently, the sense that there's got to be something more, there's eternity set in our hearts, um, is something that's still evidentiary in the world religions that we, uh, we still have around us. Yes, we're learning more about space. Now we just had that has gotten us farther out into space. The Weber, you think of scope, the Weber scope? <laughs> Weber scope? Oh, thanks, honey. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you cannot, I mean, your mind goes to right. this infinity. Right. It's, uh, it's frightening in a way. And it's expanding, so it's getting bigger, yeah. according to all the measurements mm -hmm. that they can make. Yeah. When I'm thinking, See, what people would always say, well, if Adam and Eve would not have died, where would all the people go? But that's where all the people would have gone. And, and to me, if it's, 
if it's fleeing from the earth, it's because it's disintegrating, it's going away, instead of being where it was accessible to the population that was supposed to live forever. Because if we were supposed to live forever, we had, we could populate an entire universe. And I, you know, I feel sorry for these people who, who don't, they don't get that. They don't see the amazing part of all of the beauty in that that's been created. God would have had an answer for it. What? I said God would have had an answer God for it. God would have had an answer That's who we trust. It's always been interesting to me. I heard a pastor say this many, many years ago. He said, intrinsically, people believe in God. I mean, even when they right. would, uh, swear or curse, they say, oh, God. They don't say, oh, Buddha. I'm going to step up. <laughs> they don't say, oh, you know, whatever some of the other gods are. They say, oh, God, which even though they don't mean it in a positive way when they're saying that, they're intrinsically saying, there is a God. Somebody higher. Yes, Somebody. some higher being. And it's not Buddha or I can't think of any of the other gods. Hindu, all the Hindu different, because they have a whole bunch of gods. But, you know, the, the thing is, is that it bothers me when people try to say it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe in something. And that bothers me, because uh, you need focus, and you need something to, to direct those beliefs into something good. I mean, you can't just be good for yourself. People say, well, I've lived such a good life, I ought to be just fine, you know. I'm going to go to heaven because of all the work I did. And that's their belief system. And that's, again, focusing on self and not going beyond self. That's also assuming that God grades on a curve. Yeah. Right? Well, he wants us to do stuff, but he wants us to do it for his glory. And for the benefit of our neighbor. Right. It's the two greatest commandments, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And we do that, and we, we get two birds with one stone. So what is he encouraging in verses 12 and 13? <coughs> Relax, chill. <laughs> you know, some people would take it that way. Eat, drink, and be merry. Or is it something more? It's us to do good while they live. Be happy. And people find out that a giver, I, even when I go on online and all this kind of stuff on Facebook and all that, it's interesting though. They say givers are happier than takers. Oh yeah. And if people would realize that and then give more, they would find happiness. And here it says be happy and do good while they live, and that's what it is. It's be happy because you're giving. Well, the other thing is that the line about find satisfaction in their toil, this is a gift of God. I think that's one of the things we got going wrong now. People don't want to work. They think, because it, it's all about me and what I want and what I don't want, and they're becoming lazy or whatever word you want to use, but they don't find any joy in the work of getting up getting dressed, going to work, doing whatever it is you like to do, and they're not having joy in it. It's, it's, it's become a negative task somehow. I don't know how. But. There's their burden. I think of it more as like enjoying what you have, what has God has given you. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have a little different, I spent 28 years at AT&T, and, um, I think that would attest to the fact that I complained constantly <laughs> about the idiots that were <laughs> But I did that for, I'm going to say, I'm going to say 10 years, uh, 28. And then somewhere in there, the idiots were still there in my mind, but it was the work. I, I, got, I, I had always enjoyed what I was doing. And I always had something new. I had so many opportunities there. And it, it challenges. And so it was like the longer I was there, the more I appreciated it. When I left, it was a decision to leave. But it, it still was. I didn't look back. If nothing else, all the people that I met with, right. all of the wonderful right. things. Earlier on, it would have been that other country song, Take This Job and Shove It. Yeah. <laughs> 
But, it, 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 but later on, so it's there's something to sticking with it. Right. Loyalty well, and longevity, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't I mean, find begins, that now. It begins to mean something. You see what you are contributing, mm -hmm. whatever how they big or small it is. Well, right now they're they're talking about how you know the, I don't know if you've seen those articles about the quitters mm -hmm. because you know um, because uh, there is a short supply of workers and so people it's real easy to say well I'm going to quit this and take something that's that's better. But the grass is always greener and you still grass have to work. Grass is always greener. So you still have to work at whatever you do. It's not gonna. But you know, to me it was, uh, like some people would say, you know, I could make more money teaching in a public school. I would make so much more money. And I knew I subbed at MPS for a couple of years, and I did make more money as a sub than I did at Concordia. But I'm gonna tell you, I like getting up in the morning and going to Concordia as opposed, and then I had a couple of colleagues who had worked at UWM, you know, downtown, and uh, Potter, and then one of my colleagues in the art department. And they said they wouldn't trade it for anything but to work at Concordia because of the attitudes and the feelings yeah. of the people right. that were there that even though they did the same job and you've got more money, do you really want to get up in the morning and listen to all these crabby people fighting and stuff? I mean, the faculty meetings, they said the faculty meetings were terrible because all they wanted to know was who's going to get more money for themselves or how are we going to get more money for us as opposed to we go to faculty meetings at Concordia and it was, what can we do now for our students? What kind of programs will work? What are we going to do? And the two of them said it was such a marked difference for the attitude when we got together for faculty meetings that it was absolutely incredible. Not my experience. Not your experience. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like if you're not looking at a Christian place, you've got a lot of crumbling oh, people no. who do nothing but complain. No, that's, and that's not true. Not true. That's not always true, but it was. It was a true. true. No, I know it's it's not true, but for them that was their experience. No, I agree. We have to. There there are other places. I agree. Well, there are a lot of places. Yeah, my son, the one who just had the baby, he just loves working for Glenroy. It's a Menominee Falls company, um, but uh, challenging. Um, you know, but sees real products and how it's helping both society and individual people that he works with. And, you know, he has a great deal of satisfaction in that context. And, and you know, when they, when they have their, their meetings and stuff, everything's really good, um, the way that they celebrate. And I gotta say that, um, you know, my son, who's an architect, he has the same experience of work. He just loves what he does. And he loves the people he's working with, and um, you know it's it's um, a and lot of it is what you. Thing. I, I, sorry for interrupting. No, um, there there's a lot of forgiveness there. I mean, I know from my own experience, just being myself and telling everybody what they ought to be thinking and doing, and these people put up with it and cared about me. And a long-term friend, I just lost her. She just died a year ago. Mm -hmm. But for well, almost the entire time I was there, this person was loving and caring. And and she's not, she was not a Christian, per se. So. There's a lot of blessings that can be found that. So, and, th and that's kind of that last question. Um, how do you celebrate God's gifts? You know, um, one of the things that I found really helpful is, um, you know, this whole movement about mindfulness, which means trying to live in the moment, moment in the present. Um, um, you know, one of the weight loss, loss things that Concordia had us go through that was one of the things that they talked about was not just what to eat, but being mindful enjoying what you eat, chewing more slowly, actually tasting the food, not just swallowing it. And it's amazing how when you do something like that, when you change that perspective, you eat in a different way and you enjoy the food in a different way. You know, and um, 
so it's it's that mindfulness. It's it's what happens when you go for a walk on a fall day, and are you know through woods and stuff like that. You're then you're present there. You take your time. It's a stroll. It's you're not running a marathon or something where you're trying to accomplish something. But um, I think all of those things awaken in people, many people, that kind of um, awe, wonder. Um, as one person put it, the hardest thing is when somebody's feeling thankful and they don't know who to thank. <laughs> you know, when you have that sense of gratitude, um, is there somebody to actually say thank you to? All of those kind of experiences, I think, um, are a part of that putting the eternity in our hearts and, and how do we celebrate God's gifts when we're um, with people and, 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 and when you're with someone, can you really be with them not thinking about what else has to be done? Or are you thinking the Bible about Mary and Martha kind of thing, you know? Are you the Martha that's always distracted by all the things that need to be done? Or when you're with your, with a person, um, it's one of the reasons why in our life growing up um, with our kids, one of the things we tried to do is to try to get some individual time with each of them. And what it boiled down to is we each took two kids out for breakfast um, a month. So once a week, one of us would take one of the kids and then we'd film up kids. Uh, and having four kids most months, it just worked out right, you know. Um, but having that time to be with them and going uh, to a place where uh, they weren't going to be distracted by what was at home or what was at school, but taking them out of that element and into another element where they had to be also with us. Um, uh, so there's a lot you can do to try to help just enjoy moments, to live in that moment and to be present in that moment rather than thinking about where you need to go or need what needs to get done. Um, one other thing that uh, occurs to me about this is that and it's something that I learned. It's part of enjoying life is enjoying something without having to possess it. Like walk around the neighborhood and you see this beautiful house. Oh, you know, wouldn't that be great if I have that house? house? And that, it, it doesn't, you know, it's, that's really a neat house. And, you know, I, I like looking at it. And I like thinking about whoever lives in there. I don't have to own it myself. Changes the way you deal with people because you don't have to possess them. Yeah, the way we get around that is, yeah, it's a beautiful house, but who'd want to clean it? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yep. And if you own a bar house like yeah, that, you probably need to hire a cleaner because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you wouldn't want to be doing it all by yourself. I think a lot of people bought big houses for a while there, and then after they bought the big houses, they realized they'd have to buy furniture to fill it up. And then that whole idea of cleaning. It's a lot of maintenance. Well, and just buying the big house and having the money for furniture, I know I uh, uh, mentioned the secretary at, uh, at Emmanuel, whose uh, mother had this uh, lung disease, but her husband was a, a cop for a motorcycle cop in Milwaukee, and he retired, and then he started doing part-time work out in the lake country, like Chiniqua and all that kind of stuff. And, that was one of the things that she's commented on. He said a number of people bought homes, and then you know he would have to go to a house for something, and um, they wouldn't have furniture because right. they Very were good. yeah their 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 house was beautiful, but they couldn't afford to furnish it. Um, and uh, well, let's go on to Ephesians five. Um, and, and this is an encouragement, you know, uh, about um, how we live in the current moment. So would you read it with me, Ephesians 5, 15 to 21. Be very careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. 
Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another our prayers for Christ. And uh, my first question is, when have you been less careful when you walked or over lived? When you walked, when you're walking along, when you've been less careful, when you've driven someplace. I got two dead teeth in the bottom here. My front two teeth on the bottom, I've had uh, uh, post in them since I was uh, in college. And um, I rode my bike from work to, I mean, from school to work. I worked at a meatpacking plant. And one time it was snowing, I had the hood pulled over me, I went right into the back of a, of a station wagon. Ooh. And um, thankfully it didn't damage the bike too much, but, and I thought it was fine. But a couple days later, all of a sudden, I started to have some pain in my teeth. I went into the dentist, he said, yep, you killed those two. So had to get a root canal and you know the post put in and all that kind of stuff. And you know they lasted all these years, which was wonderful, but just stupid, you know. It was snowing, I didn't, and this is a street, it was in River Forest, it's a fancy neighborhood, there's very few uh, cars parked on the road, so I thought as long as I could see the first few feet in front of me, I was gonna be fine. And then the whack, you know. Um, or sometimes you'll see people doing that on their cell phones, you know. <laughs> they got their head down, not paying attention to what's ahead, or they miss a step because they got their heads down and they're focused on something else. Nowadays, driving. Distracted very, driving. You have to be very careful at intersections if you're stopped. Not to start off too soon because you could get too long. You better look both ways. Yeah. Even if you, the light is green. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. It, and if you're the one with the jackrabbit start, that's not being careful. <laughs> well, then you, you drive by people that are. Obviously, the driving isn't so good, and then you see their head down in there. Yeah, on their phone. Or they got it up against their ear. Um, yeah, it's just a, a challenge. And, and here he says that, uh, that we should be careful how we live. So as we live, and what does he teach are the characteristics of the spirit-filled life here? If you list them from this passage, what is... What are the characteristics of a spirit-filled life? Sing, make music from your heart, give thanks. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs. That's encouragement, yeah. Encourage, thanks. Living with a thankful heart. Being wise. It's interesting, he says, make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. You know, sometimes I think, oh man, things are so bad, but I, yeah, this passage just says, make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. But that's like Christ said, be wise like foxes, wasn't mm -hmm. that the one? Be wise. And meek as doves. And, and meek as doves, yeah. but wise as fox. So it, the whole idea is just to be aware, I think. And if you think about Solomon, he wrote uh, a majority, not all, of the Proverbs in the book of Proverbs, and it's all about wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. We have to remember it's that kind of wisdom. It's not a worldly wisdom, but it's a godly wisdom that sees things in their proper uh, place, kind of building on what he says in Ecclesiastes, seeing it as a gift of, of God. Well, you can have all the knowledge in the world, but you may not have wisdom. I think wisdom is different than knowledge because you can be very, very intelligent and still have no wisdom. Still sure, do. you can be book smart and right. common sense dumb. Right, period. <laughs> you know, uh, it, it happens. Um, how does this passage remind you that it won't always be easy? Are you 
Yeah, the, the days are evil. There's always going to be evil in this world. And um, as long as uh, this world exists. So you could say, don't be filled with earthly spirits, but be filled with the spirit, spirit. of Christ. So drinking is, we couldn't call it spirits, right? So it says don't drink on wine, but fill yourself with God's spirit. One of the assumptions I always have here, though, is uh, just thinking a little bit about the wine. He says, don't get drunk on wine. He doesn't say, don't no, drink don't wine. Drink it. <laughs> well, he wouldn't have made the wine for the and wine we know, and, and we know this is the same Paul who told Timothy to take a little wine for his stomach. Or in the Bible, in the book of Proverbs, it says that wine it, it, uh, it was given cheerful, yeah, cheerful or merry heart. Yeah. Um, it's not drinking that's condemned in the Bible, um, but it's drunkenness that is condemned. Um, and and he gives the reason. What does he mean? It leads to debauchery. What happens when people drink too much? Yeah, their their defenses are down. Their inhibitions disappear. They say things they wouldn't say. They do things they wouldn't. Right. So um, the other thing that is uh, presumptive here is uh, it's not just be filled with hymns and songs and spirituals and songs from the spirit, but it says what? Speak to, Speak to one another. One this another is another friends. one of those one another's in the Bible, right? So there's serve one another, love one another, forgive one another, all of those other one another's um, are there in the Bible. This is another one. Which indicates that where we need to do this is in community, in a place where we can encourage each other as we make our journey through life and speaking to one another. Well, I think that that is true in a lot of marriages because people don't respect one another after they're married and my feeling was if you respect your spouse, you're always going to say please, thank you, uh, say things in a way that um, uplift that person and reverence that person because then you keep that love growing when you respect each other. Well, in this, uh, you're, you're kind of jumping ahead a little bit because the last verse here. Oh is another one another, right? Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, if you know the context, what immediately follows this? Husbands, love your wives. Wives, submit to your husbands as yes, due to Christ. And husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. So when I got married and that part where the obey comes in yep. at, at the 70s, you know, everybody was saying, well, we'll take that out, we'll take that out. And then it says, well, are you, what do you want to do? Do you want to take that out? I said, of course not. He says, why? I said, read the whole verse. I said, would you be willing to die for me? Sure. I said, it stays in. I mean, if you're willing to die for me, you're going to listen to me, yeah. right? So my problem with that whole thing at that time was nobody was reading the entire verse. Nobody saw the entire picture. Because right. if your husband is supposed to love you to the point Christ does, would you be willing to die for me? Well, yeah. he's supposed to lead like Christ does. Well, That's yes, the whole but... point with the headship. It's not a headship of a boss or a general where when they say jump, you say how high. It's leading like Christ, which means um, he leads by example. He never expects you to do something that he hasn't actually done himself. You know, that's actually the gospel lesson where he says, whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for, for many. That's the kind of leadership that Jesus provides. It's, and, and if you think about Jesus, Jesus also, when he was calling people to follow him, not everybody who he said follow me did. Some people did and some 
didn't. And he didn't want to run after the ones who didn't and say, you're going to follow me whether you like it or not. And so uh, people very often misunderstand that whole section, um, sometimes because they omit this verse, which says, submit to one another. There's a mutual submission. It's not just one person to the other, but there's a, a different kind of submission in the roles that are, are given there. But um, you're absolutely right, Margie. When people understand this passage in the way that Paul intended it, um, it's, it's definitely not a matter of when you say jump, I say how high. It's, I, I love you to death. Yeah, well, and that's, I, I think after you've been able to live long enough together, I think that makes a difference. And it can. we I think we got to that point where we were serving one another. I think the hardest thing for Dunn was when he was in hospice, and I had to do so many different things for him. And he, he felt like he was very frustrated because he couldn't do anything back. And I said, well, you've done all these things for me. It's my turn. It's okay. It's okay, you know. Um, and uh, because that was full time for me, yeah. taking care of him in hospice. And you think, well, he's just going to like, no. You got to feed him breakfast, lunch, dinner. Uh, you got to take care of his other needs, bathe, whatever you have to do. Right. I mean, right. it, it was a full time job. And um, I was really surprised how much work there was. I had to. He was on the oxygen. He was like on 15 liters. He had two, two, lead, two uh, things going, and I had to track that and make sure that he was getting enough or he wasn't getting, you know. And Becca, Becca came over and showed me how to work all that. And I mean, it was good. I had somebody next door, and he had diabetes type two, so I had to watch it. And I gave Check him this, his blood sugar and yeah, all I gave this big piece of he wanted apple pie and he had cops custard on top of it. His, <laughs> blood sugar, his blood sugar shot up to 400, and I called back and I said, "What am I supposed to do?" You know, and she says, "Why well, you take the two shots?" You know, and he he gave himself the shots because do the stomach thing, you know, because you don't have any nerves in your stomach. Yeah. And I and he just looked at me and he said, "It was worth every bite of it." <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, I had made the pie. You know, I did things for him. Because, yeah, and, and to me that was payback for all the things that yeah. he had to do for me, and it's it's it, that sounds terrible, but it's easier the longer you've lived with somebody and you've had that camaraderie. Experience, yeah. It's so much easier to well, do and that. I, 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 I've used that argument sometimes with parents um, that I've dealt with who, you know, will say, "I really don't want my kids to do this for." doing too much and that kind of thing. I said, well, what did you do for them for the first 18 years of your life? How many times did you change their pants? How many times did you clean up after them? How many meals did you pre prepare? You know, just do the math once for your mom and say, three meals a day, 18 years. Do the math. That's 365 days a year. And even if she skipped once in a while, it's still going to add up to a heck of a lot. You know? And, and so just thinking about, and, and that doesn't count all the other things you did in terms of helping with homework and all that kind of stuff and making sure they were in a good school and all that stuff and the sacrifices you made for them to go on a good vacation and that kind of stuff. It's just, so let your kids love you for a couple of years. You did it for a lot longer for them. And, and the older uh, you get, your kids are not gonna be around to do that for you. <laughs> So, so it's, um, now the next question I had was, um, how is this encouragement reflected in the prayer Paul had previously expressed? Just to give us a little context. Somebody want to read verses 14 to 17 for us? It's, it's his prayer uh, for the Ephesians. Uh, chapter three, I'm sorry, chapter three. Chapter three, I say for the Bible from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, 
may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. That is that um, the next two verses as well, 20 and 21. Now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. So you see the connection there? What is he praying for? That they might be strengthened in the power through his spirit in their inner, inner being. And what does he say here in chapter 5? He's, he encourages them to be filled with the Spirit, but he tells them how. By leaning into God's wisdom, by discerning what God's will is, and by speaking to each other in psalms, hymns, and songs of the Spirit, giving thanks together through him. So he prays for something in chapter 3, and then he says, here's one of the ways that that prayer will be answered as you live your lives together as God's people in that place in his kingdom. The next question is, where do you see your life growing in understanding and praise? So he prays, right, that they might grow in understanding. Where do you see your life growing in understanding and praise? Stay in the word. It's, a, it's amazing how the more we go through the Bible, the more, the richer it becomes, the more we understand it. And you, you think after all these years, after I've been in the Bible for my whole life, because I was fortunate to have a uh, religious upbringing all the way through, um, I, it's still fascinating to see what's there. And uh, so it's, it's keep working on it. Keep staying in the Word. And even when you have an old plant, I mean, I got a 40-year-old, 50-year-old jade plant, and I have to prune it back every once in a while. And it still keeps growing. And that's like us. You know, we might be pruned back, or it might be reminded of different things, and then we start growing again. Yeah. Well, that's one of the, the things I always say to uh, people who are we're talking about baptism, and we use that passage from uh, Matthew, which will be the gospel coming up a little bit. Um, he says, go, as you go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But the second half of that is, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And um, in my guidelines, I have the word everything in bold print. And I say that's because that's when you stop learning is when you know it all. And I don't know it all yet. Going through this uh, book of Hebrews, uh, this summer, um, I learned all kinds of things I didn't know before. I never preached in the book of Hebrews before, and the study led me to see things that I hadn't seen before, make connections I hadn't made before between the Old and New Testament and some of the other letters of the Apostle Paul. And um, lucky for you, I didn't dump all that on you on a Sunday morning. <laughs> because, you see, uh, one of the challenges that these preachers often have is what do you select out of what you've studied to share that you hope will be helpful to people as as they're making their journey through life and 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 uh, and sometimes it's a challenge that's why once in a while a sermon can get a little longer <laughs> uh, Jerry always warns me that if I have three point sermons it's probably going to be a little too long two points is about as many as I can do effectively and efficiently so um, the last question here is how can you make the most of every opportunity today 
or this week or this season in your life, how can you make the most of every opportunity? Ask the Lord to be on, to help you through everything. As, as things come up. Well, a little bit later on, we're going to focus on the concept of seeing and then seizing the opportunities. One of the problems that we have is if, if you're not looking for them, you often miss them, right? Sometimes I think you have to have patience so to wait for the opportunity to come. And I think patience is just as much as looking for something. I mean, you have to be aware, for sure. But I, I've read some um, interesting devotions that, you know, where, where you want to say or do something, and it tells you have patience and wait. God will tell you when the right time to do something. So I think all of that's in the mix. Yeah, and, and this is the whole part about being externally focused. If you're only focused on yourself, you're going to miss opportunities that are around you. And... And if you're sensitive to those opportunities, to the conversations that, um, where you can have an impact on somebody's life that you hadn't anticipated, you know, um, you just never know. You just, you just never know. Um, uh, one of my son in the Outer Banks, his um, sister-in-law was just going through a, a divorce very painful, um, uh, and uh, you know, we spent a lot of time with her just talking it through, just talking it through, what she was feeling, what she was thinking, um, how other people in her life didn't always understand why she was doing what she was doing and that kind of stuff, and you know, and, and, and uh, it was just a, an opportunity to be with somebody who was struggling through a challenging time in her life and, and love her through it. And it was an opportunity that I did not know we were going to have when we went there. But it presented itself. You know? um, so just being aware uh, that God is sometimes going to lead you, lead you to stuff that you... Uh, if you're, if you're open to it, you're sensitive to it, and I would also say being prepared for it. So one of the reasons why we like to spend time in God's Word is because not everything are we going to need right away, but um, I remember one person saying it's kind of like having a, a, you know, a tool set. You don't use every tool for every job, but you want the tool available for when you, when you need it. And part of continuing to grow in, in God's love and grace, to grow in his understanding, his, his um, word is so that you're prepared for when that situation comes up, that you have the tools that you need to address the issue that comes up in a brother or sister's um, life. The, the other question I could have put in here was, uh, also went just about the psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. This one just came to me, which is, you know, what's a song, spiritual song, hymn, song, that means a lot to you? Which one has encouraged you? There's currently one by John Banky that has to do with Psalm 100. And it's... Uh, to me, I, I try to listen to it before I go out in the garden because it's, I don't know if you've, you've heard it. I, no. I have it. I have the recording, so I, I can't, I haven't looked at it right now, but it, it's, it's just, it's so lyrical and it, it becomes, what do you call it, a, stuck in your ear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, that's kind of what I want out in the garden is something like that. Kind of a bits and pieces right now, so I want to 
right. Yeah, sometimes I think it can be tied to a situation. Like if I can't get through, um, I know that my Redeemer lives without tears in my eyes and a catch in my throat because we sang that at my my first grandparent who died. He died when he was 63 years old, and he was a dear man to me. And um, I remember we sang all the verses at his funeral, and I cannot get through that song no matter how many years it's been. I, I, he, I was yeah. a sophomore in high school when that happened, so that's like a long time ago. But that has become a very dear song to me. Hear me. Well, there's a lot of like songs and hymns, and a lot of them have meaning. And I was taught early on that hymns are prayers. And so the one, and some of you may have heard me say this before, the one that always sticks with me is my confirmation hymn. Oh, that the Lord would guide my ways. And that's the prayer that I pray after communion when I come back to my seat. And I still always have the hymn book because there's always music going on and people mm -hmm. singing and it distracts me. So I read the words even though I know the words backwards and forwards. That's why you have the hymn book open next to you when I sit next to you. Yeah, because I have to have that ready so that when I come back from communion, I pray that prayer or that the Lord would guide my ways. And I go through all the verses and then I go back and, and say the first verse again. So I read through all four verses and then the first she verse does it. She does, because she sits next to me in church. And my mom taught me that. She said, you know, hymns are prayers, and you need to pray them. And so that's why I use my confirmation hymn as my prayer after communion. That's, a, that's a cool practice. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's really amazing. amazing. And it's good to have it open. Good. Yes, I, so that I don't have to look for she it. Has I, she has an I always it. read the Lord's Prayer. I don't just do it by memory. By memory. And uh, because there's just so many, so much meaning in some of those words. You miss a word. Sometimes it's easier to concentrate when you're reading it as well as. Right. Well, that, and that's why, when, like I said, in communion, there's always singing during communion. And when I come back, I, I'm tempted yeah. to want to sing the song or the hymn that we're singing, but I can't do that because <laughs> it distracts me. So I have to read it again. Good. Well, let's close today with a word of prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you that you have, in this season of our lives, spoken once again your word to encourage us, uh, to bless us, to give us reason to give thanks, to reflect on the opportunities you place before us to love and serve you and to love and serve each other. And we just pray, Lord, that you would continue to bless us, to grow in your love and grace and, and uh, especially as your son did, to, to serve others in the way that he did, to bless others in the way that he did, including as we gather for worship to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to each other with gratitude in our hearts to you. We ask that you bless all of our worship uh, uh, to that end. In Jesus' name.